Welcome everybody, this is Illiterate. This week we are covering Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. <laughs> uh, my name is Evan, and I checked out the new show. I'm hanging out with my buddy Taylor. I went to George R.R. R. Martin's personal blog <laughs> to get the scoop. We had a little bit of a week where I was I was the expert, and now we're back to I don't know anything about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're not doing a big series for um, Game of Thrones, but we are going to get into it today. Yeah, we're hitting the highlights of George R. R. Martin. Probably not a lot of people know his whole deal and how he got right. in the mix and then how even the show, the original one, came to be as a gamble. Exactly. So I'm excited because, again, I'll say again, you know, uh, if you did not listen to any of our uh, Lord of the Rings stuff, this isn't this isn't my, you know, I haven't seen any of this. I know it's one of the most <laughs> the most popular shows, not one of not one of my my deals. So uh, yeah, yeah. back to the normal, uh, <laughs> the old thing of Evan doesn't know anything about this. <laughs> um, but the new show has been really pleasing a lot of people from what I gather. They're about 10 episodes in. And so it's a good time to talk about this whole series and put it into context exactly what this new show is. It's a prequel. Why? Um, <laughs> because again, <laughs> Why? this... This is a show that's come out after one of the biggest downturns of, I, I think, any TV show. This is one of the most high, highly praised TV shows of all time, yeah. basically. And its final season was one of the most um, terribly reviewed seasons of TV, basically, ever. Because, <laughs> And we'll get into it a bit because the yep. source material wasn't there. It wasn't ready for that to be even made. So they were going yeah. off book, people, basically, is what <laughs> HBO said. And nobody really... Nobody really liked that. So it was a it was a hor it was a horrible downturn that then all of a sudden there's all this new breadth and oh, a whole new we're doing it again, starting over a prequel, and every and people seem really pleased by it. So yeah. we're digging in. <laughs> we're digging in. We'll start with the stuff that we talked about, Lord of the Rings and the comparisons and what makes this a little bit different, because I was not as knowledgeable. Of course, you had to have seen or heard something in the yeah. eight years that it was running. My God, right. people were all over it. The quote that I saw from George, he said, the true horrors of human history derive not from orcs and dark lords, but from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the big distinction between this and Lord of the Rings. He was not interested in the battle between good and evil. He was like, that's not how the real world works. Mm -hmm. He wants mm -hmm. to depict it more about people and redemption and how the bad guys suddenly make a good choice and the good guys betray their friends and mm -hmm. depicting war and violence in a realistic way, which then becomes the thing that people love to hate and hate to love, all the characters getting injured or killed and disappearing. <laughs> and he, that's his thing too, because that happens in real life. And that doesn't mirror the hero's journey if right. somebody just gets lopped off at the end of season one. There's a reason why story is is story and it works a certain way. It's not necessarily real life. <laughs> yeah. Um that's that's a that's an important distinction that I think we run into a lot a lot of times with some of these things is you know so a lot of material feels like it's real we're going a certain direction but at, at the end of the day it well, it it is a story and it has to cater to a certain things and so when something envelops you this much you, you are reminded mm -hmm. of that a little bit it's a little bit of shaking away like remember oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's, I saw and I don't know if this is true but by 2018 60 percent of the major characters have died from violence. I guess that's how you define major characters, but it is a big I, thing that yeah. people love in this. I remember really my first encounter with the series was, mm, I think, summer of 2014. And I tried to watch, I didn't try, I successfully watched about <laughs> six episodes in a run in a lead up to what is known as the Red Wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and people were crazy about that. And so it was it was a, it was an interesting time to think about getting in and, and trying to catch up or whatever. So I was te I was testing it out with a group of friends. We watched about five or six episodes and on the lead up to this. A good snapshot in the middle of everything to very quickly understand what you just said, basically. <laughs> and and 
And honestly, it was a little bit of a turnoff for me at the time. I don't know how I feel about it now, but I remember at the time feeling like, mm, I feel like I want to invest in other things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, so I remember that. I remember that being my overwhelming feeling of why I did not continue with it because I, I could identify it was made very well. Um, it was very well done, but ultimately, what it was getting at, I was, I was like, not sure I was ready to to risk my investment of my energy and yeah. time, basically, if that was going to be the return on it. And some people absolutely love that. That's their jam and more power to you. That's incredible. I love that. <laughs> wasn't for, wasn't for me. Yeah. I, I think that is the big difference besides the, uh, based on being more real is it does envelop you with this melancholy, gloomy, the moral and ethical ambiguity that right. what people knew, the Harry Potters and the Lord of the Rings light triumphs over darkness, those plot t twists are tragic most of the time. <laughs> and there isn't this, sometimes there is a taste of justice, but that's what the people that did like it kept mm -hmm. going for was, mm -hmm. oh, we can find the humor or the nobility or whatever right. in these small, small pieces. But overall, yes. it's the other way around where it's quite... <laughs> Grim and dark, <laughs> hence the grim dark. I I also genre. did it. I did that same experiment later, <laughs> where I just picked mm -hmm. right back up as in the middle of what the current episode was. There was some incredible. I can't. I don't have the name for it, but I, uh, the incredible battle that took like mm -hmm. several episodes towards the end of the series that uh, I feel a lot of people were excited. So I watched the episode surrounding that battle, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I and I was like, yeah, this is the show I thought it was. And I mean, incredible again incredibly done <laughs> incredibly yeah. done but it was very much i was like yeah i think this was the show i thought it was and i'm okay with that i'm okay almost <laughs> enjoying it the way i did uh but now looking at it, it's been so much time since that that was 2015 2016 yeah um, so so much has happened to the property since then so it's 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 more than worth going back and looking at it with another eye like this yeah like the breaking bad fan exactly exuberance yes. if you were in the thick of it, go back and watch it again in our current state of the world is, is an interesting experiment to do for sure. Yes. Uh, I think since we're on the comparison and, and going back and forth, and we had talked with Lord of the Rings about how his experience in World War I influenced a lot of it, but he was also a philologist and Tolkien, yeah. lang language crazy guy, and he yeah. also wanted to cover a lot of the cultural stuff. This is also what Martin wants to do European history. The big thing is the War of the Roses, which was between the houses of Lancaster and York, which hmm. very closely resemble Lannister and Stark. And mm -hmm. there's even a book series, a historical novel series called The Accursed Kings, which was a major inspiration for him, not just the history, but there was already fiction. Oh, yes. <laughs> but okay. he wanted like to that. have magic and he didn't want to be tied to the mm -hmm. real place. The big difference, though, between him and Tolkien was Martin called Tolkien an architect, and he's more of a gardener, and that's a writer's parlance for how you approach material. Tolkien creates entire mm -hmm. languages, mythologies, histories before he even writes the novels. Mm -hmm. And Martin is a gardener where he sp <laughs> spreads some seeds, grows some seeds, what comes up, oh, this didn't, this died this season. Uh, <laughs> Many it's people think like a, it's almost like lawful chaos. Right, 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 right. So <laughs> yeah, many fans assume he is a meticulous world builder and they write him and say, I'm fascinated by the languages. I'd like you to do a study of High Valyrian. Could you send me a glossary and dictionary and syntax? He said, quote, I have to write back and say, I've invented seven words of High Valyrian. <laughs> oh, wow. So he very much is going with it. And he'll say people scrutinize sentence by sentence and oh, in this book, the horse was female and four books later it's now male what happened <laughs> I george i forgot yeah <laughs> i'm not keeping track of all of this could you imagine the scrutiny <laughs> oh god He's... you know <laughs> and the fans hate him which maybe we'll get to at the end of how oh. slow he is as if right. you know they owe him or he owes them a product versus him just doing whatever he wants well they've been uh, waiting on that book for like 20 years <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's talk about him and why they're waiting so much and how he got here. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about him, and I imagine yes, most people me either. Yes. that saw the HBO stuff didn't know anything either. He grew up in New Jersey, modest upbringing, sold monster and mythical stories to 
neighborhood kids for pennies. So he always loved the fantastical as well as being on the creative side of it. Mm. And we had talked about this aspect of him before in who knows how many episodes, but loved comic books. Stan Lee was a huge inspiration. Mm. He said the greatest literary influence on me more than Shakespeare and Tolkien. My God. And I, like I said, I forget where we said this, but he was one of the first people who wrote in. He his, yes. He's in the, the letters to the editor, Fantastic Four, number 20 in 1963. In the proven and, record. Yeah. <laughs> as he's a super fan, as well as buying tickets to the first Comic-Con in 1964. Wow. And I think he attends at least six sci-fi or comic-esque conventions per year still. He, that's his jam. Those are wow. his people. That's and awesome. he loves it. Yeah. That's he, great. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> that's. If you've that's, never been to a convention, try it. It's fun. What, it's there's, fun. There's a whatever you're into. There's probably a convention for it. Go do it. <laughs> yeah, I went to a Star Trek one because I knew somebody Ooh, that was yeah into it. And it's if it's even if it's yeah even if it's not your thing, <laughs> see what it's people. A, no, exactly, love. exactly. I had my I had my Jeep, my car on display for a horror one. I don't care. It was great. I've, I've, I, it was amazing. I love. Yeah. I love. I love conventions. I love people sharing what they're passionate about. I love sharing. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So he's all into that before he's even really making anything. He got his master's in journalism, so writing adjacent, but probably more professional mm -hmm. or applicable to gotcha. a job. He was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War and volunteered mm -hmm. for AmeriCorps instead, which I only found as an interesting tidbit because so much of his work revolves around the perils and he hates war. And yet, mm -hmm. but maybe it makes sense, his books are all yeah. about <laughs> how war destroys and tangles and corrupts and all right. of that. So yeah, his writing journey started after, and he was selling his sci-fi short stories at the age of 21 to pay the bills. He was a journalism teacher at Clark University in Iowa, hmm. and also on the side, the chess craze from Bobby Fischer, like Queen's Gambit, oh, was wow. happening yes. in the late 60s. And so he was a boss at chess, became a tournament director for the Continental Chess Association. You know, that's one of those things where I didn't know that about him until you said it, but the instant you said it, I felt like I knew it for, for years. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about, yeah, there's even still a war medieval element to it. Why not? Yeah. No, it like, it feels, it feels so very authentic. <laughs> yeah. So this was a great job for him because he was able to make enough money to where he could write during the week from 1973 to mm. 76 and yes. run these tournaments on the weekend. And so his first novel came out in 76, fantasy piece, and Star Wars helped the popularity of such things. Ooh, now people yeah. are more interested in mainstream sci-fi, even literature. Yeah, I guess this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and you'll be happy to know it's dark and depressing and sad and uh oh, good. it's uh it's about this mostly abandoned planet becoming more uninhabitable as it moves away from the sun it's called dying of the light i think it's back in print so some really up material huh? <laughs> yeah yeah uh the dying and, of the light i love yeah that. <laughs> perfect what this did for him though was very up because it mm. got him as much as three years of his teaching salary Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We see this often too, some sort of tragedy, death of a good friend, Tom Remy. Mm. This told him, well, I'd better take a crack at the writing full time while I have mm. this opportunity. And so he moved to Santa Fe because he's tired of the Iowa winters, which then brutal winters factor into <laughs> Game of Thrones quite a bit. He's experienced them. He, though had a amicable divorce with his wife just before they were about to move. Oh, no. What, and when so, was that? So that was late 70s. Gotcha. After, after his first novel, and he says, I'm going to move, start writing full-time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. breakup, divorce. Mm, oh. And so he's there a couple Lord. years alone, but one of his comics convention friends slash lovers, it's the 60s, they're uh, canoodling about Whoa. all over the place. Uh, Paris McBride, they move in together and they got married in 2011, but they've been together forever. Okay. Uh, okay. Since then. So, yeah. He, in this time, is merging a lot of genre stuff horror mixed with sci fi. He had a thing of vampire mutants in the 19th century, just to give you a flavor of the type of books he's writing. He. Mm -hmm wrote a book called Night Flyers, which then became a screenplay he co-wrote in 80. 
And so it seems like he's bumping up in this world and even getting adaptation, a little bit of Hollywood flavor. Yeah. Here comes the downturn. This horror novel he wrote, The Armageddon Rag in 83, no. was a commercial disaster. No. Didn't sell at all. Tanked his reputation no. in the early 80s. And so all editors rejected his upcoming novel. He had another thing coming, but couldn't sell it. And when <laughs> everybody you know is like, nah, thanks, we're good. He said, well, I, I signed up for a course on how to start selling real estate or getting into that. Just completely oh, yeah. gave it up. The irony, though, bringing him in is that somebody from Hollywood wanted to adapt this book, the commercial failure book. Hmm. And so he formed this relationship with this person that then never happened. Mm -hmm. But this producer liked him. And this is the same producer that was reviving the Twilight Zone. And so oh. he said, why don't you get on this? Okay. And write for this Twilight Zone uh, wow. series in the 80s. And so TV pays a lot better <laughs> than literature, certainly wow. genre, sci-fi, and horror stuff. So he moves to Hollywood, out of Santa yeah. Fe. And he is, for the better part of a decade, a staff writer, Hollywood story called. consultant. Yeah, he's in there. <laughs> he he uh, worked on some shows, wrote a lot of pilots. Some got filmed, sci-fi, et cetera. I found Incredible. an interesting yeah, thing in his personal blog where he was saying, you know, in some alternate world, maybe I became a Joss Whedon or J.J. Abrams type mm. person mm -hmm. who cut their teeth in this. But just what happens is nothing really is getting made. And mm. so or the other thing is uh, what he's writing for TV. They keep saying, well, we can't do this with this budget. There was a thing where they're like, you can have and this isn't specifically to him, but in terms of making tv shows you can have horses or stonehenge but you can't have horses in stone stonehenge. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh that's so, hilarious um there's also a part of me that's looking at this trajectory and the timeline of it and i'm and i'm seeing a different possibility for him that i don't think ever but maybe i don't know what i don't know yeah but i'm also i'm kind of surprised given his interest and the timing of all of this that somewhere through the back into the 80s or through the early 90s that he even doesn't get a, a shot at writing for video games because that takes off <laughs> yeah. through the 90s and that almost feels like that almost feels like right up his alley you know what i mean like yeah. and almost like cart before the horse kind of thing of like everything going on in game of thrones that could have that could have been an incredible video game in 1995 <laughs> <laughs> well i will tell you just as a funny aside Related to that, 2022, this game Elden Ring, he consulted yes. and wrote the mythology and backstories and all got of that. Got you, right, okay, okay, okay. So it did come back around once got he'd you, proven it more so. I was just looking yeah. at the time there and looking yeah. at all of his interest and all of his, you know, kind of nerdy, you know, stuff. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, I love all this thing. I'm, I'm, I'm here saying yelling, go to conventions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm thinking that that, was also a possibility at some point that at some level reality timelines shifted he could have went down that road he could yeah. have been some big director um but he ended up going and uh sticking to the writing yeah so with that having to cut characters having to cut battles shortening things putting it back together slapdash patchwork and then it not getting mm -hmm. made he, in 91 he goes back to novels because he right. says oh I want to make some that no, nobody, what I want to make, nobody wants to film or can film. So yeah. it just can't be done. So this is where he starts writing a game of Thrones is the first book. He plans it to be a trilogy. It becomes six and then seven. We're still waiting on six and seven, but Lord. the first one is published in 96 and does. Okay. Building word of mouth through small bookstores, the people that like this type of material. And whoa, mm -hmm. this is different from Harry Potter. That's for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> A Clash of Kings is the sequel in 98. And this made the New York Times bestseller list. So now wow. he has some yes. career some collateral. Cred. Street cred. Yeah. Exactly. The third book, Storm of Swords, comes out in 2000, which then after Lord of the Rings, the films, goes Real ah, big people are itching and fantasy, and, fantasy, yeah. baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's vastly different. And people said, Oh, I read Lord of the Rings. What else is out there? Here comes the New York Times bestseller with three books, more on the way. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. A couple things that I found from his past that we've just talked about that factor into the books. I haven't really read them. My skim, it's it's insane. One of the books 
is as much as all of the Lord of the Rings. Good so job. it's I <laughs> could not get through it, but oh maybe I will someday. But as far as the way that he sets it up, kind of like Lord of the Rings, there's third person POVs of the the chapters are of different characters. Okay. And he said he learned how to do this well as a journalism student, taking hmm. this third person POV and, and being able to cut all over the place to all sorts of so in Dance with Dragons, which is a later book, there's 18 different characters that you're getting the perspective from in the various okay. chapters which people wow. love, but it's crazy. <laughs> but that's a yeah. skill that he learned. And then with all of his TV writing, he doesn't want to, even though they're so big, he wants to leave you wondering the chapters end like TV act breaks, cliffhangers, mm -hmm. what's happening next? Is somebody going to die? So it mm -hmm. keeps you going in spite of the volume of content that's within there. I didn't realize this because I didn't know the timeline, but as far as the, this is the last little piece of the books, Hugely popular before Game of Thrones, the show. Right. In in 2005, Time Magazine called him the American Tolkien. He's not uh. nobody. To me, who is not in this space, maybe, or if you were just like, I like The Sopranos. Oh, there's a fantasy show that's <laughs> got that flavor somehow <laughs> right. or something. House of the Cards. Sopranos? I don't know. It's like- In <laughs> England. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe you didn't know that. His books have sold more than 90 million copies, 45 <laughs> language translation. He's, he's big stuff. <laughs> so with that popularity comes, people want to approach him to make it into finally. something. Hollywood. And he's been in Hollywood. He kind of knows the game. In um, and out. And now finally, we're talking, you know, 2000s. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe now Hollywood w actually knows they need to do stuff like this. We've seen <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Uh -huh. Now's the time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so the people that make this, I was entranced to learn that they really didn't have any experience in something like this whatsoever. No oh, business. Good. That's they fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So David <laughs> Benioff is a producer. He was a, and, and writer. Basically, what he'd done is feature writing until Game of Thrones. So the big ones you might know, Troy, he sold and was big. So okay. it's not nothing. Okay. But feature writing okay. is very different yes. than show running, TV writing. And yes. Kite Runner was was notable also before based on the book. Interesting. Uh, some other okay. stuff. Okay, yeah. yes. So he had chatted with Martin's literary agent saying, what kind of books you got, who you representing? And he said well, we've got these fantasy ones that are massive, thousands of pages. So David reads the first hundred pages of the first one, and his friend D.B. Weiss, who is even more fascinating, has only written really unproduced scripts and wow. things that did not get into a full thing, the Halo film being one of them in this ah, time. Yeah. He took a ride on that revolving door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, no even yeah produced credits, no TV credits, certainly. This and is these crazy. Are the, these this are the is the guys. last thing I expected <laughs> to pull out. <laughs> yeah. So D.B. Weiss reads the first book in 36 hours. They become entranced with the whole thing, as I am entranced with them. And yes. <laughs> they, talk to, they talk to Martin in Hollywood. Lunch becomes dinner, hours and hours. Hmm. And they hit it off. Martin has talked to people about this before, other script writers over the years. Mm -hmm. And they've all wanted to do a feature. Or something of that thing, like because we've right. seen Lord of the Rings, whatever. And he's like, my one book is as big as three of their books. So are you going to do 20 movies? No, <laughs> this isn't going right. to work. They knew so much about it. They won him over. And this is semi-apocryphal, mm. but he asked them, who is Jon Snow's mother, which is not revealed until season seven oh, Lord. of the show. And so it's a, it's a very... People had theories about it in the books and all of that, but they were able to deduce it. And uh, that really got him excited that this ah, isn't just, they, they, yeah. they really know the material and are wanting to go in deep and do it justice. Okay, and, they just uh, got really passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, there, it's like also it would have to be PG-13 if it was going to be films because the studios are going to tamp it down and similar mm -hmm. to, oh, it's going to be Lord of the Rings. But uh they said, we're going to pitch it to HBO. And Martin's like, great. That's where I saw it. That's all it could mm, be. Yes. We'll do a book a season. And it's going to have everything that the books have, all of yeah. the grittiness and salaciousness and, and madness. Yes. So boom, boom, boom. HBO says, sure. 
I don't know how that worked, but uh, maybe it was <laughs> they were looking for it. And uh, I mean, th- I guess yeah. I guess when when he, when when Martin is ready, that's when HBO starts to take it seriously. Sure. You know, he, you know at that point, they've got these two are coming up with material to turn around and you have a creative team then than just the author saying, oh, I want this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you show up with the creative team and the people who are talking about it and are passionate about it, maybe they don't necessarily have the demo reel to pop on, but they obvi- mm-hmm. but they can talk about this material like no other. Um, yeah. And that's what got them the job. And, and, and uh, in turn, the three of them pitching it to HBO, th- that makes sense. Um, yeah. So they're starting to develop in 2007, script in 2008, shot in 2009. Now, this is the pilot that HBO has ordered for them to do. Hmm. And this got a private viewing by notable people who were working on it, knew it, and friends and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Horrible, horrible piece of media. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, no. HBO sits on it for four months and says, you can reshoot this. And they reshoot 90% of this pilot. Oh my God. They got different cast, different director, ended up costing them $10 million, oh which God. is insane for 2009 and a TV episode. I'll put that pilot. into perspective for people. So when things go to pilot, they haven't been necessarily ordered for a season, for a show order yet. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you can go off and shoot a pilot and the studio, then they're in, it's called pilot season. They look at everything and that's when they decide what they're going to do for the, for the next year. Very often in this process, you will get a series order that dictates reshooting the pilot. It means they want to change a cast member. They want to change a storyline. So often pilots are in this between, but it's very hit and miss of which ones actually make it to network air um a lot of the times they're just completely reshot but that's on the predication of an order and this is not what i'm hearing from hbo (laughs) in this situation is that they go this is worthy of a second chance and only a second chance right is that what i'm is that what i'm reading in between the lines because typically if they're going to reshoot it they're going to reshoot it for an order a I don't full know the, season. Right, the specifics of whether or not they had the full season in mind. I just know that it was very, very dire. And I can imagine they would reshoot it and know that, hey, we're going to give them a second chance. I don't think. And they might not share yeah. that with the filmmakers. So <laughs> yeah, who yeah. knows what happened behind closed doors. But I'm just yeah. trying. Because this is different. And also HBO is a little bit different than typical yeah. pilot season. But uh, this is not totally unheard of. But this is very, this is particular at the very same time. Uh, reshooting 90% of it and what I'm hearing without a guarantee that like, yeah, okay, writes episode two. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly, exactly. So yeah, it was not set in stone. They said, oh, we could have messed up real bad, not only for the production, but ourselves in this world of Hollywood. Right. Luckily, what I mean the, is that yeah. it's 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 a you don't get a second shot at the pilot unless you got ordered. That's that's the untypical thing here is that they right. get that second shot at a pilot without fully and they like we said behind closed doors. Who knows? But they might not have fully been aware um, of where <laughs> of right, <laughs> how yeah. much HBO actually believed in the project or not. But that yeah. that's pretty fascinating. They um, were they were yeah they were saying the co president of HBO at the time said yeah let's make it saw through the mistakes. And they were like, we were very lucky Good. to have a $10 million rehearsal and <laughs> have it done over again. Yeah, yep, it, it yep, made me look yep. into, because this only came out in a recent book, really? what it was, because nobody's seen this. They're never mm-hmm. going to show it. They uh, should, man. Oh, man. I, I would be. I, that's what I'm saying, it. just for I know education. <laughs> what yes. does and doesn't work? Why did people say this is – and that's what I had to look into. Oh, if 90% is reshot, why is it so bad? You can't just say everything needs to change. Right. And so I found a couple things that one could point to as to say, you got to do it all over again. And a lot of it came down to them just trying to figure out how to present this the way that the books, it's pure adaptation problems. And right. so the presenting of the information, interwoven character dynamics, it wasn't established that Jamie and Cersei are brother and sister which then the incestuous stuff and the 
violence that accompanies mm-hmm. it is major plot points. And so then when they get together, there's no gas right. because somehow they completely overlooked that that was not put in. <laughs> they didn't, they, they knew it, but then somehow it was not relayed in the actual episode Wow, that that plot point was missing, you know, stuff, wow. stuff like that, as well as what it should look like compared to what else is out there. So in an example, in the first cut, the king comes in and nobody kneels and they said, well, this, it doesn't really matter, but it doesn't make him look powerful. So in the mm-hmm. in the re-shot one, everybody kneels. So that way he looks powerful. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And then in the design, Joffrey had a softer haircut. They make it more modern and sharp to reflect his character. Some people had wigs that were maybe a little bit ser- sillier or a little bit less sharp is the only way that I could describe it. Mm-hmm. Um a rough the, draft. <laughs> yeah. Or or that it yeah, it felt a bit too much like a British period drama, more like Downton right. Abbey or something as opposed to a dark epic mm. fantasy. And that would be the last thing is people were bored because they the scope felt small, which you had intonated in the Lord of the Rings <laughs> new series one. And yes. somebody I quote, they said, We could have shot this in Burbank. Why'd we go to effing Morocco? <laughs> that that was the sentiment. It's like they literally just didn't have enough wide shots either to yeah. give a sense of scope, stuff like that, that maybe you could right. pin on the new people involved or people that are less experienced in show running or directing. It was a first time TV director that had done this first pilot. Right. So uh, just fascinating to me. Yeah. Wish you could see it and make comparisons to know, oh, people are not trying to make garbage. Nobody's trying <laughs> to do that. But sometimes when you put it all together, it just ends up being like mud and it's not and just also yeah. like reiterating the idea that these things don't just come out fully formed, perfect off the, off the bat, you know, like this, this is creation. This is the creative <laughs> process. Um, this is people exercising narrative muscles that they've never exercised that they're discovering, uh, quite literally through the process of telling the story. Um, that's, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that they're, and they're the ones doing it. So that's the other thing with the writing, which we said people hated the last season. And did they just switch out all the writers in the writer's room or? And I'm confused from, from George Martin's perspective, because he, I mean, you know, how much is he, is he going to tell them at all what's in these books that have yet to (laughs) come out? (laughs) You know, like it's just, well, how much is he sharing with them of what his general plan is without getting specific? Because, you know, they have millions of dollars and millions of people (laughs) in an audience waiting to finish this story. So it's kind of amazing to me that the ending seemed to have been so fumbled when like the guy is in the room. (laughs) I think he was less involved. So the way that the writing He's probably off promoting and now they're starting, uh, you know, thinking about other projects and that kind of thing. Perhaps. Yeah. And he, he did intonate things, but he definitely did not tell them exactly what he's going to, and he doesn't even know what he's going to do. He hasn't finished the penultimate one. So things are changing a lot in his mind too. So it was their own thing once they got literally off book. At this rate, I don't know that these books act that the last book actually finishes while he's alive. (laughs) And he said, and the, his friends around him who would pass on the mantle like Tolkien, like Frank Herbert with Dune and his son, they said, we will not ghost write and finish what it will just, if he dies, because I think he's in his late 60s now, it will be the end. Just, uh, <laughs> he's got to put out the the penultimate one so that at least, Soon. <laughs> yeah, no, like he put, put that just, you know, pencils down and move like, got it. We got to get to that one. <laughs> Yeah, you were tough. running out of time, George. Anyway, but I'm like, I'm looking at <laughs> yeah. his timeline here and realizing that he has two epic books that have been on the table for 20 years. Uh, I don't understand what that, his <laughs> internal like, OK, yeah, I'll get that done while I'm on this earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what people get. Yeah, that's the uh, the, the millions <laughs> of foaming at the mouth people swearing at him and all that. Um, I guess he's going to die and nobody's going to find out what happened. <laughs> and, and so it's the epic. book I mean, series will be exactly like, it'll yeah. actually mirror the the Perfect, HBO yeah. series perfectly. In the that, ambiguity the ending, of, yeah. The, <laughs> oh my God. That would yeah. be beautiful. 
But at least with anyway. the the film or the at least with the TV, it ended. And uh, the way that the writing worked was Benioff, D.B. Weiss, and Martin in the room, and then four other people, depending on the season. Sometimes it was one person, sometimes it was two, hmm. oscillating. So seven total, three of which were the people that were really in charge. That's wild to me because usually you hear about bigger writers' rooms or it's yes. a rotating thing per season. But Benioff and D.B. Weiss wrote most of the episodes, and George R.R. Wow. R. wrote at least an episode in each of the first four seasons. And then that's, I think, when he stepped away to focus on this sixth unfinished novel Right, was after the fourth season. But still, it didn't come out in time and still we're waiting on it. But we pretty small writing in his time at all those conventions, not enjoyable. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you got to go to six. Go to. Yeah. You slowly lessen them over the. <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> here? Get to work. <laughs> well, that, that's the that's the thing is like people saying, oh, he actually doesn't owe you anything. And right. he's saying he had this uh, rebuttal to people that were so snide about it all. We say it in jest, but people are genuinely angry right. and it's like he's like what i can't go to a football game i can't watch tv i can't like right what what do you expect me to do i can't do what I, you want me to just sit here it, it is like misery <laughs> it's, it's like you're not a person yes exactly yeah. it exa exactly exactly people are like looking misery. at his pictures when he visited iceland or whatever and his, oh you shouldn't have been there for a week what are you doing get back to work come you on you slacker <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Oh yeah. man. Well, I I hate that that uh, that that is a, a stark reality for him that he can't even just like exist at some level uh, yeah. and not get yelled at about finishing this. But at the same time, everyone's looking at the clock. Yeah. Well, I was <sighs> so also I hearing. <laughs> I was hearing too about the thing that people are good at. Maybe they're good because they have the system that they have, like basketball players taking by weeks or off you know when you ha when you give mm -hmm, somebody a rest mm -hmm. then they're able to play in the playoffs if you yes. just ran them to the ground then they would not win the championship and it's the right. same thing it's him going to the comic conventions and yes. loafing around in santa totally fe agreed. Yep. that opens his mind <laughs> to the worlds that he is creating yep. and being in this dream state and so if you did have him just grind it to a finish maybe that's what happened with the writers of the i, I can't speculate entirely but it's the same people that wrote the show. It's not like anything changed in the last season except for the the the, the base content wasn't there. But it, people d did say that was the thing is that it felt rushed. That was the what huge complaint. What if they complaint. just like had not <laughs> what if they just like didn't make the last season yeah. <laughs> until there was material? What if it just became and all this the actors get old and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Completely recast it. That'd be interesting. <laughs> just do yeah. it. To, uh, you know okay it's out in 10 years and then try yeah. to bring everybody back uh, yeah well what did come out is this new thing fire and blood was the book that came out in 2018 yes a book did come out but it's all the backstory and appendices and it's written from the perspective of a historian in this world and so that's why it's a prequel series and he had some con obviously he had some consultation on this but there were other writers and <laughs> yeah, some people thought of it as well because he doesn't know whether the horse is male or female. He can't he can't come up with all this backstory. Uh, somebody else has got to do it. Yeah, so that's what's come out, and that's gotten more buzz and good review. I remember I'm, this is funny because I remember hearing, like I said, I, when I first was introduced to the series around 2013 or 2014, whichever summer that was. I remember hearing, yeah, like yeah, the the book is big supposed to have come out like 15 years ago it's supposed to come out any time now and i started thinking okay the show's like in the middle of its throes here and they're gonna want to do this for a while and they have enough books that are out like they'll probably like they'll probably have that book come out soon enough to be able to finish you know <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. i did not understand uh it's kind of shocking to realize that the you know still the book is still being waited on the show went off on its own track and did its own thing and <laughs> trying to make up its own ending. Uh, this happens in anime a lot. I feel like uh, you'll have a, like a manga that starts and an anime show will start and do the anime uh, catch up. Adaptation. And then yeah. exactly. They catch up to the source material. And then a, a lot of them just 
they just keep on trucking <laughs> down that <laughs> down that line. Uh, I think Full Metal Alchemist is a famous one that did mm. exactly that, and there are like three different versions of that story. Uh, just because they caught up to the source material uh-huh. and everybody's on board the train, and we're not going to stop the train because we got to keep this train going, and whatever happens happens. Um, and they're two different things, <laughs> right? Something that I had seen with george and the fact that he is also or was working with the show and writing whole episodes by himself was that he is involved in both but then really cares about the novel and so maybe even with the show doing well and him being involved in it that's why he stepped away to work on the novel and then it did really well and so now there is a lot of pressure because it is the biggest gap he did have big gaps not really that big as we said in the first three books 96 98 and 2000 that's great that's the right. tr- that's the first right. three right. and then these huge it gets the gaps get larger and larger in between Gosh. and so especially when the show is doing well and he's supposed to be working on it and then he says no it's not going to be six it's going to be seven it mm-hmm. just gets harder and harder and harder Gosh. to get with the hype and it's good it's it's astronomical and, and i could imagine as a writer that would be tough to think about on a day to day. And maybe for a week, you just have nothing because of the expectation that you're supposed to be writing. (laughs) Right. So maybe that's some of it too. Versus if he was, if he had never even touched the show, maybe there would be something different. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a thought. I I also thinking about how to coalesce all of this and him and his life. I thought it was funny. The irony of him being in Hollywood for 10 years and then leaving to go write because things could not be filmed. Then it, <laughs> what that was the most unlikely thing to ever be filmed became <laughs> the biggest thing that he did. And one of the biggest shows, if not the biggest on HBO. Yeah. How funny following your bliss and, and wanting to back. They're not ready for that. this Got him yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or roped him, <laughs> roped him right back in, but it took another decade before that God. could happen. It's like James Cameron in Avatar. <laughs> He's worked on that for for 15 years. Uh-huh. And didn't make a movie between Titanic and Avatar except for uh-huh. the documentary stuff. Um, uh-huh. Because he had the ideas, knew what he wanted it to be, and basically worked on it until it was possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly right. That's what that's what old, old George did. Gosh. This has been great. This has been this has been very informative for me. I feel like I have a better appreciation, at least for just understanding what this is. Uh, certainly, a bit about George Martin. If you're still listening to us, thank you for listening all the way to the end. Uh, I hope you've learned some. Thank you, Taylor. Incredible work, guys. Reach out to us. Let us know what you're reading. What are you watching? What are you excited about? You never know when we'll do an episode about the thing you want to know all about. So get in touch with us at illiteratepod at gmail.com, at illiteratepod on Instagram. Get in touch. Scream at us. Let us know. You hate, you love this. You hate this. We can take it. (laughs) Uh, Until next Friday, you know where to find us. Stay safe, everybody. See you then.